Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the online lecture, which is entitled Innovation Breeding Innovation, hosted by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Power Industry Division. My name is Stephanie Mary. I sit on the Power Industry Division Board and also on the Renewable Power Committee because of my interest in wave and tidal power. Before we begin, uh, please may I ask you to submit any questions you may have for our speaker via the Ask a Question box on your screens. You can also use this box if you've got any technical issues and we'll do our best to resolve those. Uh, there will be some time allocated after the lecture to answer as many of those questions as we can. And now to today's lecture, we are most honoured to have as our speaker today, Neil Kermode, who is Managing Director of the world-renowned European Marine Energy Centre, known by many as ENEC in Orkney. Everyone working in the marine energy sector knows or has heard of Neil. He heads up an organisation that is responsible for the UK becoming the global leader in wave and tidal energy by providing infrastructure for the at-sea testing of early prototype devices. And I'm sure Neil will be telling you all about that. But as the marine energy industry matures, EMEC is diversifying into alternative uses of the energy produced and is again leading the way towards a sustainable energy future. Neil is an inspirational speaker, covering the challenges as well as the successes of projects conducted at EMEC. Please join me to welcome Neil Cummins. Steph, thanks very much indeed. And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, joining this both now and uh, maybe in the future, um, the joys of the internet. Um, yeah, I want to try and impart some of the excitement that we feel about what's going on with um, energy as a whole uh, here in Orkney. And I'm going to really break the talk into a couple of uh, chunks. First of all, there's why. Why are we actually bothering to try and do this really hard thing of get energy out of the sea um, and to try and explain the, the benefits that we see coming from it? Why are we doing it in Orkney? And what we're actually doing here is the, the other main chunk. And I'm going to take you through some of the experimentation that's going on and some of the successes that are being had um, right now. I can't do all of it because we've only got um, an hour in total of um, 30 or minutes of presentation, but I'll try and give you a flavor of some of this lot. Um, and then also want to just finish off by giving you an insight into what's actually coming, because we think there is a huge um, slew of change that's coming, of which we are but a part, and just to try and uh, stimulate some conversation amongst other uh, professionals. Uh, by background, I'm uh, a, a a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, so just across the road from IMECI, uh, but my thanks to IMECI for the opportunity to uh, give this presentation today. Um, and it goes without saying that I'm a firm believer in the whole learned society approach of seeking to share information slightly outside of our normal bubbles. So I really do uh, thank everybody for their interest and attention and hope this is the start of some conversation rather than uh, me boring you to death and you wandering off never to darken our door again. So fingers crossed. So uh, the title is about innovation, breeding innovation. I really wanted to talk or I'll try and illustrate as we go through how we have found that we started off in one direction of our journey, but we've ended up doing other things en route. And I think that's entirely natural. So where does this actually really start? Well, from my point of view, I am old enough to remember doing some of my school homework by candlelight uh, during the three day week when we had uh, coal strikes and also rec remembering the changes that happened in the global energy balances when uh, OPEC decided to change the prices for oil. And so I remember um, the harshness of having no fuel. This these those events back in the end of the last century really led to some work being done by the foresight committee um, which was a report that was produced uh, for uh, government for the science and technology committee and that gave rise to looking at what could happen about in the marine environment as a whole and it produced a couple of uh, graphs which are shown there but really what they show is that the uk has got something like 50 percent of you 
Europe's tidal energy and something like about 35% of Europe's wave energy. And in terms of the wave energy, the waves pound in all the way across the west coasts of most countries. So in the UK's case, um, we've got Ireland acting like a large breakwater in the middle, but basically the top and the bottom of the United Kingdom pokes out into um, significant wave resources. And they're into the 30 to 50 kilowatts per linear meter of, of, of energy per sorry, 30 to 50 kilowatts of energy per linear meter of wave. And on the tidal side of things, we've got some very intense uh, tidal streams. Principally, they're where the purple colors are, but actually there are brighter colors still. And you can't quite see on this diagram, but right at the top, when I'll point out where Orkney is in a moment, this is where there is an intense amount of energy in the, in the body of water called the Penland Firth. So what are we trying to do? Well, the work was done some time ago that showed that something like about one fifth of the UK's current electricity demands could actually come from our seas if we work out how to make the technology work. And so from the, um, the point of view of the country, what does this give us? Well, it gives us some opportunities and principally there are three. First of all is the industrial innovation, the chance of us to actually learn to make stuff again and sell stuff to other people around around the world. We see the fact that the tides and the waves are in our waters gives us security of supply. So it really doesn't matter what other foreign leaders might think of us at any given point, they can't turn off the waves or the tides. And finally, we believe that, well, we know that the technology we're developing actually has got zero carbon emissions. So this helps reduce carbon emissions You know, once you get the whole process decarbonized. So, we see there are goals that are really worth going after. And we've been going after this now since 2003 when the company was created. And the point is that these opportunities have now come back into very, very stark focus in the last few years. So that's that's what why we're trying to get at it. The question often is, Orkney, why on earth are you doing it in Orkney? And indeed, where is Orkney? That's one question we often get asked. And if you do know of Orkney from times of yore, you'll often know a bit of the the fact of the sort of bucolic nature of the the scenery and the lovely sunsets and the ancient stone circles and various other bits and pieces. What you don't often think of it is as a place of massive innovation going on. So top left, a lot of vessels being procured and used and owned locally to actually put renewables in. Bottom left, um, the largest electrolyzer that ITM Power had made at that time. Um, uh, bottom right, low energy housing because we have a long heating season and high heating demands and the top right is a tidal turbine which i'm going to talk more about later which is where we have the world's most powerful tidal turbine actually operating in, in the waters at the moment so orkney is a place of quite considerable contrast um, in terms of why we chose to set the site up in orkney it's a place that's got big waves and big tides and therefore there's a lot of incident energy in those forms um, by big waves i mean we get waves up to 18 meters high and by strong tides, the, the body of water you can see in that little diagram is called the Fall of Warness. And half a billion tons of water moving it up to four meters a second go through that every hour. So this is an area of intense uh, energy which we're seeking to harvest. We're also fortunate we have a very large harbour um, in the middle of the archipelago called Scapa Flow. This is a photograph from the First World War showing the in turn German Navy. Um, but it's, a, it's an area that's huge um, in which you can assemble the craft or the flotilla of activities, that, flotilla of vessels that are needed to go and do the activities out at sea. We're also most northerly point on the national grid, and we've also got experience from handling oil and various other things for a number of, oh, for pretty much generations, which means we've got experience in people working in energy, the marine expertise, and also the, uh, we're used to handling energy in various forms. Uh, Steph, is your mic still open? It might be, I'm not getting some back noise. Um, so what have we actually done? We've set up EMAC, which was the European Marine Energy Centre. We were set up uh, with around £36 billion of public funding over the nearly 18 years, 19 years we've been operating. And we're a not-for-profit organisation and we're an independent test laboratory. We're the world's only accredited laboratory for testing wave and tidal energy machines, um, which brings its own challenges. But our job is to attest how good these machines are at turning the waves and tides into electricity we will supply into the grid. We have a vision of seeking to be a pioneer of a low carbon future, and we have an aim to try and help get marine energy and green hydrogen to rapidly, and that's a key part, rapidly play their part in the international clean energy systems. By rapidly, I mean we have to sort out our carbon addiction. When I was born in 1959, 
there were 317 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. We're now at 417 parts per million. So it's gone up a third in my lifetime of 63 years. We cannot afford this to continue. This has to stop, and it has to stop as soon as we can. So that's why rapidly is in the middle of this our, our aim. And as our mission, we seek to be an innovation catalyst. We help other people do their stuff. We don't necessarily um, know all the answers. Well, we don't know all the answers. We don't even have the IP on the kit. What we do is we help people get their ideas uh, realistically tested in, a, in the harsh environment um, of, of, of the real world. And we're trying to do that to help people get there as fast, as cheaply and as safely as we possibly can. So what have we got about the test facilities? Well, quite simply, we've got um, the, uh, the the sites contain cables that run out to sea and machines can then be plugged on the end of our cables, which connect to a substation, which then in turn um, uh, have got monitoring equipment and switch gear on shore and monitoring equipment at sea that, that measures the size of the waves and tides. And together, we have then tested some like 35 developers from 21 um, 21 different companies uh, from 11 different countries. So what's actually out there at the moment? We have um, a variety of pieces of equipment. Um, we've had tested two wave machines in the very recent past. One is sitting outside my window on a, on a pier, which is the one in the top right-hand corner, uh, which has been out at sea and is just being refurbished for going out again. And the one the bottom, uh, the big picture, is a wave machine from a company called uh, Motion Energy, which has been out doing some testing, about to go back to sea as, as well. So these are wave energy machines, which work uh, through the action of the waves, causing the machine to either uh, flex or changes in buoyancy. We've also had machines um, out at sea, or well, we have got machines out at sea on the tidal site. This is the or orbital O2 tidal turbine. Um, and in we've also got the Magellanus uh, Atia turbine, which is about to go back to sea and show what's going on. Um, we've actually got a short video that I want to run that I think would be useful for people now to see. So Fiona, if you'd be good enough to run the video, this talks about what's happening with the um, orbital O2 machine at the top left-hand corner. It's a video that explains what they're trying to do, but it gives you some indication of the magnitude of what's happening. Fiona, over to you. Do I need to start the piano? I'll try it. Hi, no, I'm just sharing it now. Okay, thank you. It's not running at the moment. In these difficult times, it's important that we find positives. So I thought we'd make a short film about what we're working on to make the planet a cleaner and a healthier place for the generations to come. Our mission has its origin in space, where the orbits of the moon and the sun create tidal movements in our oceans from the forces of gravity. Where tidal movements are channeled between land masses or around headlands, the flows can become accelerated like giant deep rivers. With water being over 800 times the density of air, these tidal streams offer a colossal source of renewable power that is as predictable as the orbits that create them. Our team at Orbital have spent over 17 years developing a revolutionary technology aimed at harnessing this resource, with a mission to provide sustainable clean power to millions of people, homes and businesses around the world. In 2016, we launched the SR2000. At two megawatts generating capacity, it was the world's most powerful tidal turbine ever to go into operation. We installed it in the waters off the Orkney Islands in Scotland at the European Marine Energy Centre, where it was exposed to some of the harshest tidal conditions on the planet. Not only did it break records in power production, but it totally validated our novel approach to solving the tidal challenge by attaching turbines to a floating platform rather than a fixed structure on the seabed. That way we can build and install turbines at far lower costs, whilst ensuring we can service them cheaply and quickly, with technicians accessing the turbine like a mechanic stepping onto a boat. The SR2000 was a breakthrough, but we knew we could do better, generate more power and do it cheaper. That's always our goal. 
So, with over 100 years of engineering experience behind us and climate change getting ever worse, we set about a redesign knowing we had to be bold. We had to push the limits of engineering and imagination. Through that, we came up with the O2. So the principles of the technology are really simple. We have a main tube structure that acts as our hull floating on the surface, and that's moored with an anchoring system. And inside there, we have a lot of the power equipment and electrical control stuff. That can be accessed quickly and cheaply on the surface. Now underneath the hull, we have two leg structures. At the end of each of these legs are our power generating nacelles with rotors that are capturing the energy from the tidal currents. And the clever bit of the technology is, we know that we need to do servicing and maintenance on these nacelles. So when we do that, the entire leg structure is hinged so that we can bring it up to the surface to be able to get low cost, easy access to those nacelles. This, this is the solution for low cost tidal stream energy. But building at this size just wouldn't generate enough power. We need to think about doing it bigger, much bigger. The floating superstructure is the same length as a 747 jumbo with 18 meter long legs supporting 100 ton nacelle assemblies. At over 10 metres in length, the O2 will have some of the longest blades ever seen on a tidal turbine, giving it a total swept area of over 600 square metres, or about the same area as one and a quarter basketball courts. And from that, full power, the turbines will be able to generate 2.5 megawatts of power at rotor shaft. Each of the mooring lines for the O2 is strong enough to pick up over 20 double-decker buses. In service, a single O2 would be capable of generating enough clean power to meet the annual demand of over 1,700 UK homes. And we're super excited. We're building the first one right now. And it's going to be like nothing this world has ever seen before. To help us, we've called on a supply chain that spans the UK and Europe. And proudly, we've drawn on our engineering heritage from home, right here in Scotland. Scottish steel has been worked into the world's most powerful tidal turbine on grounds where once Scotland drove at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. That just seems fitting on every level. From old industries, we can build new ones. New industries for a cleaner future. A future that depends on curing climate change. Solutions are needed now more than ever before if we're to give our children a healthy, sustainable planet. So please, follow our mission to turn the tide and become a solution. So, I am... Um, hopefully that sort of captures something of the endeavor that's going on and i really do urge you to have a look at orbital's website because um as a series of mechanical professionals i think they've done a really good job of making this a very human activity and showing that it's about the people who are delivering this um and frankly i, I find it hugely inspiring so there are several videos about different members of the team so i'd urge you to have a look at that when you get a moment so um that's what's going with Orbital, and uh, um, other devices are also available, he, he stresses uh, quickly, but they're, they're the ones with the best video as far as I'm concerned at the moment. So t following on with the theme with um, Orbital for a moment, um, they also have been doing, um, um, this is a, a diagram of the machine, and this is some of the photographs of the machine actually in fabrication in Dundee, and you can see from the structure of the machine, it's effectively um, a large tube with uh, the clever electronics at various places uh, within it and its uh, connection systems. And the point was, this is really um, a fairly straightforward design, and it's been built to be buildable. And a lot of effort has gone into that. And indeed, some of the activities that have happened are, are I think, are 
good engineering. Um, this is the uh, one of the hinge joints, the nacelles going on the ends of the arms, the blades which were manufactured down on the south coast near the final machine. And the point is that this machine um, has been brought together by using the skills and abilities within the United Kingdom. And the machine itself has got something like 80 percent UK content. It was sort of designed and conceived up in, in Orkney, um, partly designed in Edinburgh as well, um, and then the various companies that have brought various parts around. So my point is that this is something that is actually generating real jobs. This is not something that's just a bunch of um, uh, uh, graphics. This is something that's happening here and it's happening right now. But we also need to recognise that the construction of a new industry doesn't just rely upon this being just about uh, the machines themselves. There's a lot of work that goes on around making this thing, these things happen. And this is absolutely about real jobs in, in the marine world, in diving, in the supervisory side of things, in the planning, the execution, the project management, the structural design, all of this. All of this together is what is going to make um, a, a new industry. And we firmly believe there are demonstrably real jobs to be had and infrastructure needs to be provided in order to help this. And I'll talk about this in just a minute because this pier was actually extended in order to allow um, renewables to happen. I've also mentioned briefly earlier the, the vessels that have been procured and are operating. And these are, show a couple of multi-cats that are owned by local companies, um, both of whom are diversified, one from a construction industry into marine renewables, the other from fishing into marine renewables. So it's actually a, a series of successor industries to other things. And it allows the existing supply chain to broaden its base and, and grow as the industry, industry is created. And just in case people don't think this is actually real, on this particular day when the photograph was taken, there were four tidal turbines actually being worked on on this pier at the time. And the point is, if there's no pier, nobody gets to work. So we need to build infrastructure ahead of need. Now, that's quite difficult for politicians sometimes because they want immediate fixes. But actually, what we need to recognize is this is a, is a long term endeavor to find a way to find new ways of harvesting energy from the sea. And for that to happen, we have to make sure that we have got all the pieces in place. Infrastructure being a key part about this, because if you haven't got a pier, you can't even start this. And so there's no point thinking, oh, we've got the turbines. Where are we going to put them? You need to have somewhere to put them before you build them. Sorry, I'm letting my uh, civil engineering side show there. I'll, I'll put that away again for the minute. The other thing we've also done is is things like we're doing today is talking to people and explaining what's going on. So EMEC has set itself up as a bit of a shop window to try and help people um, help make this stuff real. And in part, we both talk to people and explain what's going on. And we're happy to show people if they're in the area what, what we can. And we do make a point of trying to influence people. And here is an example of uh, Richard Graham MP and also Amber Trevelyan, who was energy minister at the time, coming up to see the orbital machine. And I'm pleased to say we also hosted a visit um, with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge as part of the uh, work around the orig original Earthshot. And in fact, we're now one of the Earthshot nominators for uh, different ideas, principally to find a way to inspire people to realize that this is a way in which we can tackle the climate problem that we all know is coming. Um, and sometimes we're a bit short of ideas. Well, this is about trying to show that there are ideas to make it work. So that's what we're doing in the marine space. All sounds great. Loads of energy, loads of tides, Technology is working, we see um, ideas coming forward, supply chain is growing, but we have a problem. And the problem is we have a 20th century grid. Now, the grid was actually built to Orkney in the first place in order to supply small amounts of power to these islands of 20,000 people. So the way the power systems were built in the past, as we all know, was basically dig it out of the ground and burn it at the pit head. So minimize the transport uh, you possibly can with the coal and then send the electricity down wires to where it's needed. And frankly, the further away the wires go, the thinner they get because there are fewer people on the edges. Well, the, we know that the world is waking up to the fact that we're now going to be a renewables dominated uh, energy system and the renewables are pretty much on the edges and we're going to have to feed energy from the edges into the wards of the middle so we have what we know is an in, inadequate grid that's not critical of, of what was built in the past it's just an observation that it's not going to be right for what we're going to need to do in the future 
And so we've been spending some time thinking about what can be done in fact trying to tackle things because we've got some snags. How do we get the energy from that tidal turbine off that island and get it into uh, into the UK supply? Well, Orkney is the most northerly point on the national grid, as I mentioned earlier, but the cables that we have are very small and we've got about 60 megawatts of export capacity from the islands in total, um, which is running on two cables. So we originally were set up to use about 30 megawatts and through a variety of means, um, the, the, the DNO has been enabled to allow us to generate more than one cable can handle. So we have a system called the Active Network Management System, which allows us to export energy from the Isles. But it still means I've got a very limited grid capacity. And in our case, I've got a four megawatt grid capacity. The tidal turbine you saw the video about is just over two megawatts. So it means I could only take two mega two turbines on the site. Um, so we thought, well, we, we can't put up with that. We had to find a way around the grid restriction. So we started to look at what would happen. And this graph shows what would happen if you put more than four megawatts of tidal turbines onto the network, in this case, peaking at six, but maxed out our grid connection at four. The point is we could export the green stuff, but we couldn't export the red stuff. So what could we do with that? And we realized that we, if we stored it, we could do something useful. And that led us very, very quickly to hydrogen. So we realized that could we electrolyze and store this energy and then turn it back into electricity in the gaps between when the tides stop, turn and go back the other way, because the generation also slows down, stops and then starts again as the tide turns in the opposite direction. Could we do something about using the energy in those in those gaps, which would then give us a resultant output of pretty much continuous energy? That was what we were trying to do. So we started to look at what what could could be done. And we realized that hydrogen was the best way to do that storage because of a whole bunch of different parameters. Um, but hydrogen was definitely the thing. So that's what we started on. But we also did, had some work done for us by Element Energy with um, with Exodus, which gave us some really interesting information about the value of hydrogen. And what that showed was that if you have hydrogen um, and you turn it back into electricity, it's worth about 30 pence a kilogram. Whereas if you take that same hydrogen and use it to propel stuff, and in our case, ferries, it's worth about £4.60 a kilogram. And the point is that we need a lot of energy to move our ferries because that little ferry in the top picture there uses around 16 megawatt hours of diesel a day. And there are nine ferries that operate in Orkney. And indeed, the ferries that come to the islands, um, one, of the island, one of the ferries that comes from Aberdeen to Orkney uses as much electricity as Orkney. So ferries are big. They are something like 15% of our carbon emissions in the community. So could we use hydrogen in a way to propel things rather than simply turn it back to electricity, which would be comparatively low value? So it started to change our ideas. Go back to the subject of the title of the talk, Innovation Breeds Innovation. We realized that if we can actually do different things, we start off doing one thing, we realize we might need to change part way through. That's that's what we started doing. So the last piece is really to talk about what why we started to move into different places. So one of the things we are we we are blessed with is we do understand the energy here. And as part of a UKRI funded project called the Reflex Project, an energy audit was redone. It was done first of all in 2013 and then done redone in 2019 to look at the update. And it shows where we use our energy. And in the second column shows the fuels we use. So kerosene being the top one, electricity being the, the, uh, the next big block down. And we go through road diesel and gas oil. And that is used in a variety of ways, in a variety of forms. But principally, what it comes down to is that so much we use for heat and light. And this is what we use for transport. So transport's a big thing for us. And we spend a lot of time decarbon decarbonizing um, our electricity supply. But the problem is, basically, in all the effort we've done in the last years, we've just decarbonized that bit. And so we know there's a lot more we need to do. And in fact, if you look at the rest of it, the work we have done, even though we produce around about 120% of our electricity from renewables, we've probably only done about a fifth of the job. So there's a lot more to do. And that led us to thinking about what the, our energy system is going to look like in 2030, because we know that we are still probably going to need the similar amounts of fuel, may change a bit, but pretty much all of it's going to have been electricity at one point. We will have we will not just be making the small amount of electricity, we need to make electricity to do everything. And then that electricity will be supplied in a variety of ways. We may 
we will supply some electricity straight to point of use like electric vehicles we may be putting a lot of it into heat pumps indeed we're seeing a lot of that in the uk um certainly in orkney uh heat pumps are the predominantly chosen form of heating in houses now we also believe that the electricity is going to be turned into um, hydrogen through electrolysis and some of it will then be turned into synthetic hydrocarbons i'll talk about that in the last few slides and then we'll also end up turning some of it into ammonia because it may be easier to handle um, than pure um, uh, hydrogen and there may be some advantages over synthetic um, hydrocarbons under certain circumstances and then there's going to be other stuff that we don't quite know at the moment but principally it's all going to be in electricity at one point and so we started to work very hard on what we could do um, and hydrogen so hydrogen we, we, was the piece that we could really get at most easily and so that led us to build something of a hydrogen ecosystem and so we have got hydrogen i'll show you some photographs of the hydrogen production plant in a minute we are now transporting the hydrogen down to the uh, to the main port we are then using that in a fuel cell and the fuel cell is then being used uh, to produce electricity but also heat from built heat for buildings and the electricity is being used to power the ferry when it ties up alongside in port and we've also got vehicles which are running on hydrogen but probably they could now be done by electric vehicles instead because this has been going for a few years but most importantly the thing we got out of it was it was getting people to actually understand what could be done and trained and competent and capable to work on this so we've got something of this ecosystem forming and we believe that's fundamentally important to uh, understand what the new world is going to look like so our test site up on ed just quickly show what's there um we built it originally to take on the power from the sea onshore into our power station um, and we've got our substation we've got um, the grid connection which is a 33 kv connection which was plowed in over that hill and by the way the plowing going this distance and the same distance the other side of the hill uh, took a morning to do um, they got the the cables in underground and out of the way and out of sight and out of the weather particularly we built our electrolyzer chain which is supplied by itm from sheffield and we have half a ton of hydrogen storage on the site which we then move around in trailers as i just showed you in the previous photograph but more recently we realized that there are some changes that we wanted to make principally because the issue of the tide stopping and starting again which i mentioned earlier which we were trying to fill in by using hydrogen in that gap we've realized the electrolyzer will work better if we can keep it running continuously so the storage issue has changed our focus has changed and so we've now recently completed a flow cell battery storage um, site which has got a 1.8 megawatt hour 600 kilowatt uh, flow cell battery system in there which is i think 40 30, 45 30 kil 35 kilowatt units something like that um, which uh, produces um, which we charge from the tides um, and also from the local wind turbine and then we are going to be using that to discharge to the electrolyzer to keep the electrolyzer operating when the tides stop so once again we started off looking at how do we deal with tidal energy i've now ended up with a large flow cell battery working on two states of vanadium um, and hydrogen storage yeah. innovation breeds innovation so this is all the upside this is the, the the upstream side of producing hydrogen but you know great what are you going to do with the stuff when you've produced it and one of the challenges we had was we've had to both build the use of hydrogen at the same time as building the supply of hydrogen because there's no point making the stuff because what are you going to do with it but similarly there's no point having a demand for hydrogen if nobody's making it so like the the infrastructure you've got to make the stuff before you can use it and so we recognize and really are determined to make sure there's a there's more hydrogen than we need because it needs to be that way around if we're going to progress as fast as we can having more demand than you've got um, supply just means frustrated demand so we have to we have to make sure so we've been looking at a variety of ways in which we can use our hydrogen i want to talk to you about um two different ways in which we've been using it um actually in aviation which has been something of a surprise so um, a company called igtl came to us and they have actually um, got a process which takes uh, uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide and combines them um, in in plant which then produces synthetic gasoline now the point is if that gasoline if that sorry carbon monoxide comes from a 
non-fossil source, i.e. we've taken it out of the atmosphere, either from a biological means or from a direct air capture, if we've got carbon monoxide that's not got fossil carbon in it, we combine it with hydrogen, which has no, which has no carbon in it, we can make hydrocarbons that don't involve fossils. We can actually allow um, the use of some hydrocarbons, it takes energy to do it, but we can actually have some of our activities, which we currently do with hydrocarbons, can still be done with hydrocarbons, but without the climate change impact. Now, I know there's the issue about where you um, exhaust uh, aviation fuels in the upper atmosphere and the, the exhaust gassy stuff. So this is not this is not without impact. But my point is that this has actually been done here. We su we supplied uh, hydrogen to IGTL. They manufactured synthetic gasoline, which was then supplied to the RAF, which they used in their first ever fully synthetic flight. The other thing we've also been doing is working with another company called Zero Avia, who have done some work. And I'm sorry about that top photograph. I don't know what's happened there. I've obviously picked an old photograph um, where they used um, hydrogen in um, a converted uh, Piper aircraft um, in, a, in a project. And they've they are been working on a the next generation, which is uh, a 19 seater aircraft, um, which they're looking to commercialize. And we've supplied the hydrogen refueling infrastructure, which is in that truck, um, which is really to help them. Uh, show how we can start to decarbonize because the flights to and from the islands are also critically important in terms of our lifeline infrastructure. In fact, some of the kids actually fly to school because you can't get there by ferry. So it's, it is important to us here and we need to find a way to be able to operate life in these isles without, um, without damaging carbon. So overall, we think we've been having quite a major impact um, from what we've been doing. The, the activities of us practically trying ideas out actually creates learning by doing and we think that's so so important it's the, it's the adjunct to the theorizing and it's a pre it's a it's an activity which is needed in order to get to commerciality and what we are helping to create is this pre-commercial knowledge we don't necessarily know it all it's the companies who come and work with us um, who, who learn stuff and we help that to happen but the creation of pre-commercial knowledge through practical demonstration we think is absolutely fundamental and we're seeing we're actually making some real progress on the, towards net zero across land sea and air and we want to continue doing so so the final thing i want to talk to you about is the fact that there's a fundamental big change coming and really to excite people to recognize that everybody needs to really get with the program um, and I know I'm talking to mechanicals, but frankly, what we really, really need is a lot of electrical engineers as well, because as I mentioned earlier, everything's going to be going through electrical. So if you get a chance to encourage anybody into our respective engineering worlds, please do so, because there is a lot coming. And in terms of the way the energy system is changing, I mentioned earlier about the, the way in which we're not burning coal at pitheads. There's also a big things happening most recently, which is if we look at what the UK is using or was using when I did this slide back in March, around about 36 gigawatts of electricity on, online. We are just in the process, um, or the government has just, or Crown State has just awarded leases for a series of wind energy areas around the north of Scotland, which amount to 25 gigawatts of wind energy. So what's that? 60% of um, what the UK is using in electricity is potentially able to be created um, from wind energy. Or more accurately, we're going to add a further 60% to the UK's electricity supply. So this is coming. This is coming, and this is coming big style, and this is going to involve huge change. And principally, we see this as being as significant as North Sea oil has been to these areas. Um, now, it's further north than North Sea oil has generally been. It's largely been down the North Sea, but we see this is absolutely going to be coming. And the point is that we're going to have to change how we make things work because, say, the diagram on the left-hand side is the national grid, and the bit that where it's going to be getting the energy isn't even on the map. So there is grid to be built. There's absolutely grid to be built, and it may well be that that grid is not going to be just the only way in which we move the energy around. We believe in the work we've done so far that hydrogen is going to play a fundamental part in this, um, and we expect that some of the electricity may be turned quite quickly in hydrogen, maybe at sea, maybe on land, and actually move south because hydrogen is a very effective energy transmission vector. And I'll answer Chris Gould's question about uh, storage uh, later on, um, or in the questions in a minute. But 
the point is that other people are realizing this is a thing now and i just really want to leave you with the fact that the oil terminal here in orkney is actively looking at how it could reposition itself to uh, become a hydrogen production facility and use a lot of the infrastructure a lot of processes and particularly the skills of the people and the safe systems and all of the control work that's allowed the site to operate uh, safely for the last few decades to repurpose that into a space which is then going to be producing um, hydrogen and that hydrogen will then be shipped out either by pipeline or ship or whatever's going to happen so everybody's waking up to the possibilities of this happening and so really what i want to leave you with is the fact that what we are trying to do is find ways to help shine a light on the future because that's what we really need to do and i'm going to leave you with a quote from we had painted above the door and it's about to be repainted in the office here from john f kennedy when he spoke in the doyle when he said the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by the cynics and critics whose visions are limited by obvious by obvious realities we need people who can dream of things that never were and ask why not that's what we're doing here we are really keen to talk to people who've got ideas who've got ways to find a solution to this and and of of need help in making things work um our job is to try and make this happen because the alternative of not making it happen is simply unthinkable thanks for for your time i think we're now going to go over to questions so um i uh uh, Steph, I think you're in charge of the questions. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Neil, thank you so much for a fantastic and very uh, illustrative presentation about all the stuff that's going on in Emic. And I was thinking, I bet 20 years ago when it was first thought of, nobody would have dreamt that you'd be doing stuff for aeroplanes. Absolutely, absolutely right, Steph. <laughs> so, I mean, that sort of uh, illustrates the fact that uh, how technology moves forward and, you know, you sort of said we need people, or Kennedy said we need people who can dream the impossible. Well, I think that's what engineers can do, actually. That's what our job in life is. Mm. Um, so uh, we've had a few interesting questions. Um, Neil, I don't, this is going to be quite a dif difficult one um, for you to answer. Um, but the one from James Edge, I think, Probably it's for developers rather than you to answer this, but I don't know the answer to this either. Yeah. What is the typical payback time of one of these energy generating devices for investment and also CO2? Yeah, very good question, James. And in fact, it's critically important that that is um, we get the right answer on this because there's no, this is not a hobby. You know, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen because it's a sound investment and we need to make sure we get more energy back out of this stuff than, than we're putting in. Now, at the moment, these are just prototype machines. Um, and they are comparatively expensive, uh, which is why government has introduced support in the last contracts for difference round called AR4, application round four, which was announced, um, I think, is it only this week? I don't know, it seems to have been a long week already. Um, it was uh, announced very, uh, very recently that support is being granted to uh, several tidal projects, two in Orkney and one uh, in Wales and one just in the north of Scotland. Um, and that, uh, it will help the payback and basically I think they've agreed on a price for the contract for difference I think it's 178 pounds can't remember now uh, per megawatt hour um, so it, it, it is it is a comparatively expensive process however the point is that we all know that the more we do things the better we get at this stuff and so practice not only makes perfect it makes cheap so the plan is that we we through the act of repetition we will drive cost down and there are cost curves uh, and learning rates that are showing that show that if we get to around about a gigawatt of machines installed so that's around about 500 machines installed we believe we'll be at cost parity with offshore wind uh, as it is at the moment now of course offshore winds moving as well so we're, ch we're chasing each other around but it, it is on a sensible trajectory and it's certainly a lot cheaper than some other technologies which are which have been around for a while so we know we need to make this um uh, cost effective in terms of the carbon payback it's not much different re we think really from um uh, onshore wind it's in that same sort of space which we're seeing paybacks in sort of in in the years mark so offshore wind or onshore wind here i know there's were turbines put up recently that was showing a payback for carbon in about 
I think it's nine months. Now, at the moment, because our shipping is carbon intense, obviously we're, we're using a lot of carbon getting the stuff here. Once you decarbonize the shipping, then that carbon burden disappears as well. So there's a virtuous circle which happens as more of more and more of this um, happens. But um, we can we can see there are ways in which this can be dramatically improve. And the final thing is the material science side of things will change. So at the moment we're making this stuff in steel. I don't think we'll be making it in steel long term. It'll be probably pultrusion and and various other. Um, uh, advanced manufacturing techniques, which themselves don't have to involve, you know, uh, melting rocks. So um, I, th I think we, we have a journey to go on on that. It is not um, we are not cost we are not carbon negative at the moment, but we can absolutely see how we are. In practical terms, the tidal turbine I pointed out did seven percent of all in Orkney's electric. Sorry, the, the predecessor to the one I showed you, and the one that's in at the moment is expected to do better. A couple of years ago, did seven percent of Orkney's electricity uh, through uh, an extended period of the year. Um, so we're confident this is actually going to drive us in that right place. Um, happy to take supplements on that if that's useful because we've got no audio on this. It's a bit odd doing it dead to a to flat screen. So forgive me if I've not answered your question, James. No, I, I think you've done that really well. Um, right, if we move on, there's uh, somebody, Jason Collins, I don't know if Collins Webb is his surname, it's not entirely clear. I think this is an interesting question. He's talking about the knock-on effects of on ecology, weather patterns, etc., by wind energy, and mm -hmm. whether wave and tidal energy is going to have similar effects on uh, sea currents and coastal zones, and also, do you think there's going to be a danger of public and political objections to large scale adaptation of marine energy? And that's a real, yeah, <laughs> I know what you're going to say about that, Neil. So I'll, I'll, no, uh, pass no, it to you. <laughs> yeah, th thanks. Um, you're absolutely right to, to ask this, and it's really important. Um, just for context, my background is I used to work at the Environment Agency, so I've been an environmental regulator, so I'm acutely aware of the needs to make sure that we both fit into the regulations that are around now, but also the regulations themselves are, are a function of public concern, of technical challenges that have been in the past, um, and, and the states of knowledge. So we, we work really closely with the regulators to try and help them to understand the real challenges that are coming. So picking up the point about the environmental impact, um, what will be the impact of putting these tidal turbines in these various locations? So do we think we're going to harvest enough energy out of the tides to actually make a difference to the tidal speeds? Um, I wish, frankly, um, because the scale of what we're likely to put in is unlikely to be limited purely by the energy. It's more likely to be other uses of the sea. So it's things like, you know, do you still need to take a ferry through here? Is this a major shipping route? Do people fish nearby? You know, so there's a whole bunch of different parameters. So um, I, I generally don't think we're going to see um, significant difference. Uh, and in terms of the wave side of things, most of the, um, the the coastline forming processes are often driven by storms, um, and the machines that we put out are going to be surviving in storms rather than harvesting the energy from storms. They'd like to take energy out from the from the general movement of water. That, that, that intuitively, there is definitely going to be a change caused because we're extracting energy from a system. The system will be different as a result of extracting energy. We don't believe that the the scale is likely to be significant, but we are assiduously looking for this now, even on the small numbers of machines we put in, so that we detect a problem before it before it becomes clearly manifest. So we are acutely aware. We could have an impact on wildlife, and there was there was concern about that because what uses the water? Well, diving birds, fish, mammals, people. So. The thing is with tides, nobody really fishes in these really strong tide areas other than, say, lobster pots. So the, there will be trawls in these spaces. We don't think we're going to have an adverse effect on that. In terms of the birds and the, and the fish, we've done some work already monitoring the, uh, the use of the site by birds before we put the stuff in. And whilst the stuff is in, 
and once the stuff is taken out and we're not really seeing significant differences in there in, in, in birds basically what happens is there's a slight reduction in, in in animal movements when people are out there tinkering around with machines but as soon as they go the animals seem to come back in fact we've got film of birds sitting on the tidal turbines resting before going in to dive into the water and go and do some more fishing so there's an upside as well to some of this stuff um in terms of fish we we the the density of the water and the density of fish means that we don't really see that there's going to be um, large impacts. And in fact, from what we've seen, fish don't tend to be in these strong tides when the tides are strong. They're often in these areas when the tides are towards slack water. And we've seen on the cameras them fishing, uh, um, feeding and through things in the seawater. But we often just don't see them on the cameras when the tides are strong. So we think they go somewhere else. It's too blooming hard to stay there. So, and those are the times that the turbines are generating. Um, and, and then the issue is then sort of whales and dolphins, are we going to have an effect on them? And we are looking very closely to see what happens there. And But we haven't seen problems. We've seen killer whales up, operating near the tides, uh, up in the tides near the machines. Um, generally speaking, they often don't operate in these very strong tides. Um, they may go through these areas when the tides are not as strong. In other words, they, why thrash you? Your, your bits off against a really strong tide when you can wait six hours and go through when it's really calm. So we we suspect that the 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 usage patterns of these areas is not going to be a problem. But we are really looking because we need to make sure this is not a problem. If we are a problem, we can't do this. It's just it's very simple. Um, politically, we suspect that the jobs are going to be seen to be important in these marginal areas. So we generally think that people are going to be keen to see this happen in a lot of areas. There is a there is a chance that this this could be regarded negatively in some areas if they if people believe this is adversely affecting their property prices. But to be because often the sea is what gives property value. Um, but against that, we also believe that the scale of the, of the interest that's being seen in this means that this is a positive thing happening in these areas. These are new jobs being created for young people to work in and people to diversify in. And so we need to make sure that people are positively orientated towards this. Because if people think it's being done unto them, they will resist. If they think they are part of the mission, they will they will be with it. So it's, it's really important we get that bit right, which is why partly I'm talking to you. I hope that's answered your question there, Jason. But a lot to do. And drop me a line if you want to. I'm happy to talk about it more. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing amount of information you passed there, Neil. Thanks. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions which are sort of similar about the government. And I'm uh, support of wave and tidal energy. And I would say UK government rather than just government, because the Scottish government, in my view, has done an awful lot um, to support marine energy. Um, it, so with the government's uh, current lack of interest in the Swansea Tidal Lagoon, does this indicate the same for the whole non-wind and solar solutions? And also government have done in recent years very little uh, uh, about the energy strategy. How can EMEC help push the government forward towards action? So, yeah, th thanks for those. Um... I mean, I've got some sympathy for government because everybody comes to them with their great ideas and they go, oh, really? Now what? Um, uh, and the energy picture is changing hugely at the moment. It is, and, and, I, and I don't envy anybody trying to work out the future given the lead time it takes to make this stuff work. I think the big difference we have seen of late is we have now got kit in the water that's doing what it says on the tin. Um, and this stuff is knocking out two megawatts of power day in, day out, and showing it works. So I think we're in a very different place to where we were some years ago when some of the ideas were tested, when sort of the ideas were put forward about the energy strategy, which at the time focused very much on the, the dash for gas um, and nuclear, and then was really anti-wind. Well, that's moved hugely, and government has really realised that offshore wind is a is a huge opportunity. Um, we've seen solar has gone from something that was regarded as... Um, uh, something that was never going to happen to now you know, almost a well it is something you can buy at Ikea you know it has moved very much front and centre and I think you know public opinion is moving that into the right sort of space and it's it doesn't almost doesn't matter what government does in terms of solar in some respects people are going to put it on because it's the right thing to do and it works so I think 
part of our job is to is that shop window piece where we try and explain to ministers, which is why I showed the photograph of Anne-Marie Trevelyan earlier when she was energy minister, showing her this stuff is real and this is these are real jobs to be created. And it's no longer just an energy play. It is also a um, a, a, a building, a, you know, build back better, a leveling up, you know, a, a, a just transition. It fits into so many different agendas. So I think our job is to show people this stuff and go, look, we can do this. And government will then go, Oh, okay, let's get on with it then. So what we really want to do is, is as somebody once sent me an email and at the bottom of it, it said, um, well, the people, who, the people who say this can't be done, please get out of the way of the people who are doing it. Um, and that's my appeal, really, which is all we want is to make sure that government policy enables this innovation to be able to show that it, is, it deserves a space. And we believe, we firmly believe that this is something of a no-brainer. So... We, we, we're we not arrogant in that, but we just believe we can make this work. And what we need is, an, is a following wind and a few regulatory hurdles to be removed uh, from in front of us. Um, Steph, I see there was a question from Neil Hackett as well about Salter's, uh, Salter's ducks. And I, can uh, I thought that was going to be a one-word one answer, but um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you tested any? <laughs> was, uh, no, except one of the students from Stephen Salter was Richard Yem, who invented the Palamis machine, which we did test, which was basically a snake-like version. Palamis is, uh, I think it's Latin for sea, sea snake or Greek. Anyway, um, uh, and so we... and. And we are testing some other machines which are sort of um, uh, had their genesis in that space. So, no, we haven't. And in fact, I uh, saw, saw Stephen only a few months ago, and um, he's still coming up with great ideas. He's got some great ideas about cooling the planet from uh, cloud engineering, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> yes, I'd forgotten about Richard G. I and mean, he was one of his students, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, yeah and right. uh, Chris Retzler as well, and indeed all the digital hydraulics that have come out, that um, that all came out of that same team in um, in Edinburgh, I believe. Uh huh. Um, what else have we got here? Um, I think this. I think you covered this sort of in your presentation. This is from Ian McAllister. Very interesting. Do you see an appetite to combine wave and tidal energy with ongoing wind developments? Yeah. So. Um, I didn't, but I think there is something starting to happen here. And, and there's two parts. One is the fact that this offshore wind is going to involve putting infrastructure into remote areas, which therefore removes one of the impediments that we've had of trying to make marine work, which is not just make the technology work, but what do you do with the energy when you get it onto the beach? And if there's no grid anywhere near, you're a bit stuffed. So I do think that we are going to see some synergies there. The other thing is we and there are companies who have got um, ideas which basically use the foundation of a wind turbine to generate some wind energy while they're at it. Um, I'm not sure I see much in the way of tidal energy in offshore wind because generally speaking the areas of strong tide are not the best place to go and put a wind turbine because it's blooming hard. But we, we will see. I was wrong on other stuff. I'll probably be wrong on this as well. So um, let, let's see where it goes. Hmm. Um, Chris? Ian has another question about well, upscaling of the, uh, of the current yeah so um wind sorry wave has got a huge amount of space to 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 grow into um because as i mentioned west facing coasts have got waves basically due to the coriolis effect and prevailing winds so there is a huge opportunity you look at the length of chile you look at the the, the western seaboard of the united states and europe and africa and australia and new zealand you know there's a lot of space out there and so i think there's a huge opportunity for that in terms of the upscaling for tide that's about going going to different locations um, where there are hotspots. So there are distinct hotspots, you know, between North and South Island, New Zealand, hotspot, between Tasmania and Victoria, hotspot, you know, various spots around the, the globe where there are the strong tides. So there will be um, different machines developed for those different types of environments. Tide is different, however, to offshore wind, or sorry, to wind, where we've seen massive growth in the size of turbines, um, because turbines now are principally limited by material sciences. You know, how big can you make this blade before it snaps, or, or how tall can this tower be? Um, we, on the other hand, are pushing water, or allowing water to go through a channel, and so there's rock at the bottom of it. So we can't extend the machine bigger than the channels are deep. 
so that we have got some physical limits. So we expect we're going to see the machines max out probably around about three megawatt mark, I expect, for tides. But I, once again, could be wrong on that as well. Okay. Um, one here from Ross McKenzie. Uh, you, you've got that, yeah, European energy regulators clamour for immediate supply insurances. Do you expect this to have an impact on the available resources provided to EMIT? Um, it, well, it, yeah, it, th there's always a risk that um, that people manage to persuade somebody to sign a, 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 an easy check, which is we'll do LNG. And the point is LNG is is only slightly it was shown as a green fuel, but it's only slightly less awful than than, than the other stuff. You know, it's twenty percent or so better, but you know we need a hundred percent better. So um, I really hope we don't. That the siren voices don't win in terms of trying to go for new LNG because it's just nuts and, it, and it's short term and we know it's not sustainable and, and we know it's a finite resource so it, it's balmy in my opinion so hopefully we don't um, I think we've got a, some really dangerous siren voices as well about this whole thing about oh you've got to rip out your gas boilers put a heat pump in well no you just take it out when you when the when the the gas boiler needs replacing you know i think we need to make sure the language is right and, and as engineers i think we've got an obligation to get that right um i'm fed up with people talking about uh, retrofitting houses do you ever go to b and q to with you to retrofit your house no you can redecorate it or, or develop it or renovate it and we need to use the right phraseology to get people into the right space um so there is a danger that we we sign off on the wrong stuff Something I think we do we need to keep our eye on and we need to be absolutely aware of is that fusion, I think, has made some real progress in the last few years. And I am really hopeful that we can make fusion work because fusion does give us a chance to, to do a huge amount. And I've always seen it as a good bet. Um, but you need a plan B because if it still stays 40 years away, then we're, we're, then we're going to have a problem. But I think it has made some big jumps of recent years, and I really think there's, there's a big opportunity that Fusion could come over the hill as the cavalry as well. <laughs> right. I think we need to draw this to an end, but there are a couple of questions about hydrogen, which if you yep. can... Yep. I'll, can I'll, I'll quickly it... do one. Chris, um, it's stored as gas. We store it at about 200 bar. We don't do it as a liquid. Liquid hydrogen takes about 15% of the calorific value to actually make it liquid, and it's real nasty stuff to handle. So we're staying with gas. We're staying with low pressure gas at the moment because it was as far as we could afford to go. Um, I think we are unlikely to see liquid hydrogen used widely. I expect we'll probably see the hydrogen combined with something like nitrogen to make ammonia or carbon to make hydrocarbons rather than liquid hydrogen because it's it's a pretty pernicious material. Uh, Al, and Alan I think asked, you've sort of answered Morgan Morris Ironside's question there. Okay, we'll, we'll just ask that one. Um, so we're transferring it. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, how will it go? How will it go? We don't know. We suspect, personally, I suspect synthetic fuels will become um, the, the main way will work. Will it be am ammonia or hydrocarbons? I don't know. Ammonia is a bit noxious, well, it's, it's noxious, and there may be challenges, but the hydrocarbons, the challenge of hydrocarbons, believe it or not, is finding the, finding the carbon. I know in a world where we're complaining about it, but trying to find the, the carbon to make hydrocarbons is, is a challenge. So there's a lot to do in that space. And for completeness, I'll answer Chris, Chris's one then. Um, Oh, Alan. Alan, Jennings. Alan, yes. Um, now, we've got flow of energy. What about seasonal demands? So we're we're not doing a lot in the seasonal space, other than if you make um, synthetic hydrocarbons, you can store them in a bucket. You know, so um, we think the just as we do at the moment, most of our diurnal energy supply is. Um, based on a very long season, which was back in ancient times, there was sun was shining and then now we burn it. Um, I think we're going to see synthetic fuels used in that space. Um, I also think the other point is we don't ever really see heat as a, as a seasonal store. And there's a massive amount of work to be done on heat. And we're trying to do something there because we think there are there's opportunities around the heat, waste heat from electrolysis and the heat needed for other processes. So we think there's a there's a sort of coalition of um, of interest around heat, which may lead us to some seasonal activities. OK, Neil, thank you so much. I think we really do need to draw this to a close now yes. because we've run over time. Oh, we haven't. We sorry um, for, for the attendees. Thank you for your attendance. 
Um, you will be sent a, a link to this recording um, if you want to watch it again, which I'm sure some of you will, because it has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Neil. Not at all. Absolute pleasure, Steph. Thank you for listening, everybody. Um, have a good day, and please go and change the world. <laughs>